thank you, thank you all for coming out. Um, just a few brief announcements before before we get started. Um, November fifth, from nine to eleven, uh, we we have our fall community cleanup day. Uh, we would love if, if anybody has uh, that date free or that time free to come out and help us out. Uh, we do this twice a year. This is the uh, we do it in the spring and the fall. This is the fall version. Uh, being a community-based church, uh, this is a chance to get our faces in front of their faces um, and to, to uh, let the community know uh, who we are and what we are all, all about. Um, and if you uh, have that time free, you can come out and join us. That would be fantastic. Also, uh, coming up on November 12th, um, from 11 to 2, um, I may have said the community cleanup was 11 to 2. That's 9 to 1, actually, if I didn't. Uh, the the uh, meeting at the Rock up, up, up in Philadelphia, that is Saturday, November 12th. Um, that will be from 11 to 2. Um, if uh, you haven't had a chance to, uh, to go up there with us, um, it's, a, it's a very sobering uh, look at uh, uh, what the life is like for the lost. Uh, and uh, we, we go up there and help, help the folks up there. Uh, try to uh, minister to, to the folks that are out on the streets there. Um, it's, it's, it's a very sobering event. Um, it makes you thankful um, uh, for you know, all that Christ has done for, for us. Um, and it just reminds us uh, of what Christ has told us we are to do, uh, to go out and save the lost. Um, so if you have an opportunity to uh, join us there, that would be fantastic as well. Um, any other of all of our events that we have uh, coming up, um, they're all on our website, ghproject.org, uh, if you would like to learn more. Um, we also, um, we are a member-supported church, so if you would like to uh, donate to us, um, we have the box over here on the wall. You can also donate on the website, um, ghproject.org. Uh, just click the Donate tab, and it's kind of self-explanatory from there. Um, okay, well, let us pray. Father God, thank you for bringing us together here today. We thank you for your grace and mercy, which you pour out on us anew every day. We thank you for the message that I uh, am going to bring through you, or you are going to bring through me, actually. Um, and uh, today we pray for little Ava uh, next door. Um, she uh, has a uh, respiratory illness um, that I brought John in. Uh, home early from his uh, anniversary, uh, so uh, prayers go out to her. Um, I hear she's doing better, uh, so uh, praise God for that. Um, and also, uh, I would like to uh, uh, pray for uh, all the members here who uh, were friends or and acquaintances of the gentleman next door, Chris, um, who passed earlier this week. Um, Please uh, yeah, pray, pray for the, the, the folks that knew him knew, and knew him well. Um, comfort them, and uh, we should just take comfort that he is, uh, he is with you, Lord, um, as we all will be soon. Okay, today we are in uh, Second Peter. Um, we're going to be doing, uh, we're going to be finishing up. Uh, we're in chapter three, verses fourteen through eighteen. Um, we have spent the last several weeks in Second Peter. Uh, today, as I said, we'll be finishing up the book. Before we read this text, I'd like to uh, first recap uh, what we've learned since we started in this book uh, several weeks ago. From the very first few verses of the letter, Peter starts with four things that all Christians should take to heart. The first, Jesus Christ is our God and Savior. In this letter, Peter is going to discuss um, false teachers that try to deny it, uh, the, the, the sovereignty of our Lord uh, and lead us astray. Therefore, from the outset, Peter declares unequivocally who the person of Jesus Christ is. The second is that all who believe in Christ as our Savior have an equal standing with the Lord as the apostles do. Although they were able to travel with Jesus and share his daily life does not give them greater faith than us. The apostles did not carry PhDs in faith as a, real, as a result of, ha of their having witnessed the miracles and teachings firsthand while we have associate degrees. As he tells us in the beginning of his first epistle, 
Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter makes the point here, there are not greater or lesser faiths or multiple kinds of faith. There is only one faith in Jesus Christ. Third is the faith that we receive is through the righteousness of Christ. We didn't obtain this faith because we were smart, intuitive, or special on our own. We have not earned this faith by any of our actions. As Paul makes it painfully clear in Romans 3, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Don't sugarcoat it, Paul. Give it to us straight. <laughs> Without the righteousness of Christ, we would all be lost. Sin has separated us all from God. But it's through his mercy and grace that Jesus died on the cross. It is Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, who convicts us of sin in our hearts, so that we may seek after him and turn to him for redemption. To all that have come to Christ, Paul reminds us in Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that none of you may boast. Mm -hmm. The fourth is that we have been given, uh, this being said, we have been given everything that we need to live the lives God calls us to through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Everything that pertains to life and godliness has been given us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit who dwells in the heart of every believer. It is only through God's divine power that we are saved from the penalty of sin, and only through the divine power that we are saved from the power of sin in our daily lives. Having, having been given this gift, we are to build our faith, adding to it the qualities of Jesus. Peter lists these qualities as virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. With virtue being the firm foundation, each one of these builds on the ladder. In that our salvation was achieved through no work of ours, we are to make the effort <clears throat> to use these tools to productively, to productively serve God. To not do so is to waste this gift. Peter goes on in chapter 2 to warn us, of the, as I said, of the false teachers within the church who will twist the word of God. They will speak heresy, denying the salvation of Jesus Christ. Instead of preaching the blessings of a virtuous life, of seeking God and abstaining from the corruption of the world, they will follow their lustful desires, and as a result, Christians that are new in their faith will be easily led astray. The consequences of these actions will be harsh. Verse 3, verse three tells us, their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. God is not forgotten. His judgment will come as exactly at the time that he sees fit. In chapter 3, Peter implores us to remember the teachings of the Old Testament prophets and those of Jesus through the apostles, and not to be surprised when scoffers appear. Presuming upon the belief that God has not passed judgment yet, they will mock those who believe, and dismiss his return as fantasy. They will try to convince us that it has been so long since Jesus promised his return, nothing has changed since the beginning. But they deliberately overlook the fact that the heavens were formed long ago and that God formed the earth out of water. And when man was, uh, was and I'm sorry, and when man was irretrievably, irretrievably lost in his sinful desires, Passed judgment of all on all in the flood, and saved Noah and his family by these same means. The world was different in the time of creation, different after the flood, and so no one should get uh, should doubt that he will make it different again in the end times. <laughs> only then it will be judged. Only then it will be judged by fire. One thing to keep in mind, however, is that God is eternal and not limited by the human concept of time. Peter quotes Psalm 90, uh, verse 4, which reads, For a thousand years in your sight are but yesterday when it is past. If we were to look at this verse in our concept of time, it has been since Friday, 
It says Friday morning when Jesus promised to return. Most of us couldn't even clean out our garage in that time. <laughs> this is not a formula for us to predict end times. The point being made here is that God is not held to a clock and that we cannot apply time demands to his perfect plan. That being said, the day of judgment will come. The heavens will be set on fire. The elements will be burned up. No one knows when this will happen and it will occur, it, and will occur swiftly, as Peter describes, like a thief in the night. Referencing what Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, but understand this. If the owner of the house had known what time the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready, for the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. In light of all this and the topic of today's text, Peter asks us, since all of these things are to be dissolved, what sort of people will you be? We are to live holy and godly lives, looking forward to his promise of a new heaven and a new earth, where righteousness will dwell. But what are those lives look like? Which leads us to our text today, in th Peter's three, uh, chapter three, verse fourteen through eighteen. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish, and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters where he speaks. In them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and and the day of now and to the day of eternity, Amen. How many of us went to high school? All of us. How many? Of us, how many of us? In, two people. Two people went to high school. Uh, well, uh, how many of you remember it finally? I do not. Um, I was a fairly good student. I was a lazy student. Um, today's teach uh, text reminds me of a time back in high school when we had a public speaking class um, that was kind of tied to our English class. And we had to give, everybody had, we were spending an entire week, and everyone had to give an eight minute uh, summary of a book they were assigned during the week. Mine was Pride and Prejudice. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. Definitely not, uh, definitely not a guy's novel. But so I did what every other guy in high school had done. I ran out and bought the Cliff Notes. Uh, I read the Cliff Notes. And uh, even then was late to the point that I didn't even write the report yet. The day came, day came when it was due. And uh, I had not written anything yet. So you know, we, went, we went into class. And we were, the teacher was going to call call us uh, up to, to give these to give these reports, but just like every other guy, I thought, there's 25 people in this class. Well, well, you know, the odds are pretty, what are we, one in 25 that she's gonna call, that she's gonna call on me. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, we all know how that, that works out. Uh, the teacher decided that she was gonna you know, go in alphabetical order according to first name, and Aaron was absent that day. Oh. <laughs> 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 so, uh, we all know how that turned out. I went up and flubbed through my, uh, my report and uh, did not get a very good grade on that. Um, <laughs> all of us know what I should have done. I should have stayed home just like Aaron did. <laughs> because he, I'm sure that's why he stayed home and, and didn't, didn't do his. But, this is not how you make yourself ready for the Lord. Um, on a more fonder note, um, I remember awaiting the, the birth of my first son. Um, I uh, have a, a stepson, David, uh, who has been, you know, I have considered, he was four when I came, when he and his wife, came, he and his mother came into my life. Uh, he was six when we got married, and I uh, considered him a son since the day I met him. 
but I had never experienced um, uh, childbirth um, or you know, having um, one of my own uh, ch children. So I did you know, what everybody else would do. I went out and read a thousand child rearing books, every one of them saying the opposite thing of what the last one said. <laughs> you know, research what type of crib to get, you know, the best diet for the babies, uh, best way to hold a child, um, you know, how to you know, not ignore David and include, include him and everything that was going on so he doesn't feel left out, uh, baby proofing the apar apartment, um, just, just stressing over every single detail, you know. Yeah, which makes me remember, you know, back when I was a child, I was one of, I was the second oldest of four, and you know, my parents, you know, were the same way. But uh, I also remember by the end, you know, my, my 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 father couldn't get our names right. He couldn't even get the genders right. You know, hey, it's Steve, I mean Paula, I mean Kat, Andy, you know who you are. Get over here. <laughs> you know, and you know. When, when we have a newborn, uh, a newborn, we, uh, you know, if, you know, if they, if they plop down on a beehive, you know, it's, it's, it's the end of the world, you know, and, you know, my parents, by, by the fourth child, you know, if, if you, if you weren't bleeding from two different places, you know, uh, or, you know, had a limb hanging off, you know, you, you were told to rub dirt on it and go back outside. <laughs> but I digress. Uh, all these things that we did, we did, um, I did with uh, was a prepare, was a prayer everything to make everything perfect for that day. This is what our mindset should be for the coming of the Lord. Verse fourteen tells us, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by Him without spot, without blemish, and at peace. The end times is not a comfortable subject for most. It is a part of our human condition to be ashamed of our sin and fearful of making an accounting before God. But Peter beseeches us, first showing his love for us by calling us beloved, to remember our salvation and to look forward and to prepare for the day that Jesus returns. Though we know these truths, we must remind ourselves daily, the enemy is always on, on the attack, trying to see doubt in us. We are to confess our sins to one another and help each other to live morally pure lives. If you have a troubled relationship with another member, then we must try to resolve it. If you are struggling with a simple habit, then you, should do what you, can, you must do what you can to repent and brief, be free from it. A couple weeks ago, John shared a story, uh, John Clifford shared a story of when he was you know, lost in the grips of his addiction that he went out to, uh, to make a drug buy and the gentleman that he handed the money to took off, said, I'll be back in just a couple minutes. And the guy never returned. Uh, I'm, sh I'm sure if John had more money, he would, you know, and, and at that time he would have tried again and again and again. But, so, have you ever noticed that when we are you know, caught up in the sin of our own, how when we try to perform this sin, for some reason, the, the strangest of obstacles now we'll get in our way. Our car won't start. Um, there's you know, too many people. Or, there's so many people around when there's not supposed to be people around. Yeah, God, God in this hatred of sin puts many stops in our way, as if to say, "Do you really want to do this?" It is up to us to take these uh, warnings and to get a hold of ourselves and correct the, the simple behavior that we're involved in. None of us are even close to be uh, where we ought to be in our walk, but we ought to be diligent. Peter likes this word, diligent. He uses it several times in his in epistles. In the first epistle, verse 5, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Verse 10, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling. Verse, in verse 15, I will make every effort, be diligent, so that you may be able at any time to recall these things. It means to be intentional, intentional and committed. We dedicate our efforts to a lot of temporal things. Jobs, hobbies, staying in shape. This, by the way, staying in shape, 
is one example of how spiritual, spirit, scripture gets twisted. People say scripture says the body is a temple, so glorify God in your body, which it does in 1 Corinthians. And they tell you that that means that we are all supposed to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> what it in fact says is that body is a temple because, the whole, because it houses the Holy Spirit in you. And glorifying your body has nothing to do with being fit and everything to do with glorifying God by avoiding sexual immorality. Let us be clear that there is nothing wrong with these things, hobbies, jobs, of themselves. For example, we can honor God by putting in an honest effort, but if it's an all-consuming drive for money or for power, this is not serving God. Hobbies help us to relax from the stress of daily life. But if we dedicate all our free time to our hobby, and at the, at the neglect of our spiritual life, this is not healthy either. It is this per the perspective and priority that is key there. The key thing we must do to be intentional is to read scripture daily. Not only read them, but to study them. If we find a particular passage that is difficult to understand, we're going to ask questions. We are not to read simply for the knowledge for knowledge's sake. It reminds me of uh, the movie that maybe a lot of us have seen, Good Will Hunting. There's a scene in the movie where uh, Matt Damon and Robin Williams are sitting on a park bench. Matt, da Matt Damon plays a very intelligent uh, person, but doesn't have a lot of drive. And a lot of it due to things that have happened in, in, in his past. But Robin Williams kind of, kind of, kind of calls him on the carpet for this. Uh, he basically sh t tells them that you know, you know, if, if you if I asked you to tell me about love, you'd probably quote a sign or read me a poem. But what do you know about love? Have you ever you know devoted yourself entirely uh, to a woman and had that woman devote themselves entirely to you, to be with them in sickness, to be them with them in health, to be with them in, in all things? Um, he gives another example of war. You know, he can probably you know, you know quote you you know or, you know the, the strategies of every battle of every war, you know that there that there has and you know that, that he has studied. But have you ever been been there and have a fellow soldier dying in your arms? The point of this is is real world versus experience. Um, uh, I'm going you know. Give me a little uh, poetic license here. I've been, you know, I am in the oil industry. I, I, was, I was in the oil industry as an operator. So I dealt with a lot of engineers. Engineers are very smart people. They're good at designing things and good at, at putting uh, good ideas in, into uh, work uh, that, can, that can improve situations. But, <laughs> Coming from, you know, a lot of this, you know, we, we, we say there's book sense and then there's real world sense. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of engineers wouldn't know a crescent wrench from a crescent roll. <laughs> so, uh, my experience being, you know, in, in that industry is that a lot of the things that are implemented, they never have, get any kind of input from the operators that are doing the job. Mm -hmm. um, it's simple things as placing, a, you know, the, uh, the pl how a valve handle is placed can make things ergonomically impossible for the person to do thing, do the job safely or to, or to work on that particular thing safe, safely when it's a matter of flipping it around. But not being out in the, in the real world, uh, in, in the actual industry, they don't understand this. So this, this my, my point being is, is that yeah, this experience, is ne this real world experience is necessary. Yeah, and this includes when we read you know, scripture. To read and understand scripture more, more confidently is, is way way we can better apply it to our daily lives. Second Peter 1.8 says, for if these qualities are yours and increasing, um, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The best way to read this is the converse. That if we are diligent and are growing in the seven qualities that we spoke of earlier, then we will be confident, effective, and fruitful servants of God's kingdom. Peter ends this verse without spot and blemish and at peace. 
For if we are committed to leading virtuous lives, we are found faithful and at peace with God. As Paul tells us in Romans 8, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Verse 15 uh, goes on, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him, as he does in all these letters concerning these matters. As we read this in verses 8 and 9, we cannot lose heart because in our eyes it has been a long time since Christ has promised his return. We should instead look upon this, de this delay as God's patience with us. Mm -hmm. That through his love, he is willing to give us more time that more people can come to Christ and accept the, uh, him as their Savior and enter into an eternal relationship with God. Peter also states the fact that not, that not only is he in agreement with Paul in this, he also recognizes Paul's writings as Scripture, saying that they were divinely inspired, written with the wisdom of God, with, with, written with the wisdom that God gave him. Verse 16 tells us there are some things that are in them that are hard to understand, the writings of Paul, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. Many of Paul's writings are difficult to understand, as Peter says. Uh, for one, I struggle with it because it seems that in the day of Paul, punctuation wasn't invented yet. Paul is the king of the run-on sentence. <laughs> I, I constantly have to double back and say, oh, where are we going with this? <laughs> with this in mind, many of the false teachers would twist his writings into doctrines that ran contrary to his message. One such example is Romans 3.8, where Paul asked the rhetorical question, and why not do evil that good may come? They would teach that uh, we are saved by grace. That, um, Paul had meant this as a, as a rhetorical question, not as a statement. They would teach that since we are saved by grace, then people were free to live lives of promiscuity without consent. Because if it's all covered by grace, why not? Peter warns that any, do, any that do this, do it to their own destruction. Please do not let this intimidate you, though, from reading the Bible. He is not writing about Christians who are having difficulty understanding the Word of God. Many of us, for example, um, myself included, have trouble with the book of Revelation. Um, there's, set, there's, uh, there's biblical scholars that disagree on the context and the teaching and meaning of, of Revelation. Paul, uh, Peter is speaking to those who deliberately twist scripture or use it out of context to fit an ideology that's not of God. Any doctrine that does not include Jesus as Lord is straight he up heresy. Mm -hmm. We must remember as we read 1 Corinthians 3.11, for, uh, Paul tells us, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 17, um, he reads, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. So how do we keep this from happening? It cannot be stressed enough, be in the Word. The more knowledgeable we become, the more you can steer away from false doctrine. Uh, as you can strong in the world, uh, in the word, um, you hear something and uh, that doesn't pass the smell test. Um, whereas if you're not, uh, if you're uh, new in the word or um, are not engaging in the word, you can, you can um, fall victim to this. For example, trying to, you know, Trying to be open-minded, we can start to let worldviews slip in in ways that don't match up with God's Word. The second way is prayer. God loves nothing more than when we earnestly seek Him out. If we come across a confusing section of Scripture or we're not sure how to handle, pray to the Holy Spirit for guidance. The third thing, a way we can do is be connected to your church. It's only being connected to a body of believers that we can feel a sense of brotherhood and community. We all know what it is like, you know, how bad it is to be left on our own and left to our own devices. <laughs> uh, 
There are two ways of living that Christians must avoid. The first is the belief that saved people, as, as saved people, we only have to wait Jesus' return and that nothing we do can make a difference. Although not all agree, many believe the phrase in verse 11, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, that it is possible for us to hasten the return of Christ. Not that we have the power to alter God's plan, but one can look to several events in history, in biblical history, to show that God's use of man in the, ex in the execution of his plan. When God delivered Israel from Egypt and told the people he wanted to put uh, them in the land of Canaan, all but Moses, Joshua, and Caleb rebelled and refused to go in. So God had them wander in the desert for 40 years before that, uh, until that older generation died off. When God planned to destroy Nineveh for their wickedness, Jonah preached that the, the city would be overrun in 40 days if they did not repent. When the people repented, God spared the city. And also, in the Great Commission, Jesus sent his disciples out into the world to preach the gospel, telling them, I am with you always, the end of the age. Many differ on eschatology, but as Christ all Christians believe, Christ is returning as our Lord. The same God who established the end also establishes the means of the end. And by his own choosing, we are part of that means. The second is the opposite extreme, in that we come to believe that our efforts in serving God somehow merit our salvation. We don't do this to um, earn a place in God's kingdom. We do it because we already have one. So in conclusion, we must do a gut check and ask ourselves, are my actions and thoughts tied to the things of this world, which be gone in an instant, or am I doing God's will, that my works will please and glorify Him? We learn in the parable of the talents of a man going on a journey and trusting his wealth to three servants according to their abilities. One receiving five talents, one receiving two, and the third receiving one. The first two invested uh, the money that was entrusted to them and doubled it. The, the last one, uh, scared of the responsibility that was given him, buried it in the ground. When the man returned from the journey, the two that had, had invested his money were told, well done, good and faithful servant. The man took the talent from the first, from the, from the last, and gave it to the first, saying, to everyone who has, more will be given. But to one who has not, even that will be taken away. God has blessed us each with special gifts. Some are more remarkable than others, whether it's preaching on Sunday or setting up chairs, ministering to victims of addiction, or providing a ride to a new member to church. Be they large or small, they are every one of them essential to the King of God, Kingdom of God. So let us not spend our remaining time resting in the knowledge of our salvation, but honor Jesus' sacrifice for us by obeying his command to take the gospel to others and living morally pure lives, eagerly anticipating his return, that we may be also told when we see Christ, well done, good and faithful servant. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you that we have been called out of darkness into your glorious light. By your divine power, we have been chosen, redeemed, accepted, and equipped to live the godly life that you desire of us. We have been endowed with Christ's righteousness, have received the Holy Spirit, been identified with all his goodness and grace, and accepted by you. May we live lives that are worthy of your sacrifice and everything give you all honor and praise. In Jesus' name.